Hello everybody, Ben Woodruff here with another Falconer video. This video is a big one that I've had to put a lot of time into trying to doing it right. And it, it's, this will be kind of the complete breakdown of the Tida Falcon. The Tida Falcon, if you look online or if you try to look up books or articles, almost everything gives you hardly any information. It's condensed and it's mostly just repeats, repeats, repeats of what's been said, you know, for the past 50 years or so. And uh, so this video, I want to kind of give a breakdown and really kind of go in depth on this bird biologically and in many different ways. I want to start off giving a very special thank you to Bo Parks, to Nathan Norris, and to Chi Ma, who all made it possible for me to acquire a Tida Falcon. This is a Tida Falcon that's been part of a breeding program for many years, and uh, now it's kind of retired from that, and so I've had the, uh, the joy to be able to work with her for a bit now. Now for me, you gotta understand, for me, I'm a biologist, I have a background as a paleo artist, I'm used to looking at organisms from the inside out. And for me, I have this romanticized view of the age of discovery, when people, all different peoples from all different countries were going around the world, expanding, exploring, uh, you know, 14, 15, 1600s, even into the 1800s where people were coming, you know, to the Galapagos Islands for the first time, and being able to encounter animals and learn and understand them and kind of break them down, so to speak, and understand how these biological processes work and what it means to be a flightless dodo or a, you know, a marine iguana or even with fossils, some of the new fossils that were discovered along the way as people came to new lands. And uh, with that, I'll never get that chance. I I'm never going to have that chance. The Tida Falcon has given me an opportunity to do the closest thing. It's a very little steadied species. And very few people who do study them go into the depth in some of the strange ways as like a paleo artist would. And so this has been so fun to get to know this. It, it is, this is heralded as being the most highly specialized species of falcon in the world. And as such, as I have shared my thoughts, my observations, and done my research, it has uh, necessitated that this video will be slightly different format. And that, I don't know if you know this, if you watch my channel, my videos, I just share my straight. I don't script anything. I just share experience. I share knowledge. I'll, I'll plan a little bit ahead of time what I'm going to say, but nothing scripted. This isn't scripted either, but I have bullet points of all the points I want to cover so I can try to make this as condensed as I possibly can. It'll probably still be a long video. But because of that, I hate some of the, if I have to look over at my notes, there may be edits that are different, that are not normal, where you'll have a cut, a cut, a cut, and that is why. That's not my normal format. So the Tida falcon is an African species. It's very small, and there is estimated to only be about four to 500 pairs left. So not a particularly common species. It most often lives near waterfalls. Not always, but most often. And it typically hunts almost exclusively bats, and swifts. Swifts are tiny birds that are insectivores, and it makes sense if you if you, if you you Af a lot of Africa is not water rich. A lot of it is, but a lot of it isn't. And so, if you're in a more arid area, waterfalls attract a lot a host of insects, all different kinds of flying insects that attract swifts and bats that eat those things. And if you're a tida falcon, you just sit above on the cliffs and wait and dive down and catch your prey. Um, with that being said, they are somewhat crepuscular. Most people are familiar with the term nocturnal, you come out at night, diurnal, you come out in the day. Crepuscular are species that like to come out a bit before and after sunrise and sunset, dawn and dusk. And so they do a little bit of uh, nighttime, early nighttime after sunset, hunting of the bats. And that's kind of unusual for a falcon. And something worth noting. Now remember the whole thing about swifts, bats, and waterfalls because it's going to play into things here in a minute. One of the strangest things to find out about the Tida falcon is that they evolved directly from peregrine falcons. Uh, scientists have analyzed the cytochrome B mitochondrial DNA and they've done a study and they've said, okay, we're gonna analyze this. Uh, they took samples from 11 different subspecies of peregrine falcons. If you're familiar with peregrines, peregrines live almost everywhere in the world. Some are bigger, some are smaller, some are darker, live on the coast, some are bright red. There's, there's a wide range of subspecies of peregrine falcons. For this study, they also took samples from three separate Tida falcons and several other not closely related falcon species as well uh, to assess the haplotype diversity 
of all these falcons and specifically where do Tida falcons fit in and the Tida falcon was nested directly within the peregrine clade and so what that means is the Tida percentage so the the the, the sequence divergence of their dna Tida falcons are 0.4 to 1.2 percent genetic divergence in their DNA sequence from a peregrine. Now that overlaps with peregrine subspecies because all the other peregrine subspecies were 0.0, .0 to 1.0%. That overlaps. So the case could be made, you could consider really a Tida falcon to be a subspecies of peregrine. That argument at least could be made. Now they are their own separate species. Uh, but there is enough genetic in common with the peregrine falcon that this tiny, tiny little falcon could be argued to be a subspecies of peregrine falcon. Now, what we have here, when I, as I've been as I've been working with this Tida falcon, it has been so strange because I'll, I'll just have her, you know, sitting next to me on the couch, we just watch documentaries together, and I look down at her, and it keeps throwing me because she looks like a peregrine, kind of like a somewhere between a, a red nape shaheen peregrine and a black shaheen peregrine she looks kind of like that coloration wise markings but she's tiny she's like the size of a tv remote and but the colorations are so ingrained in my brain that it's like glitch 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 no 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 you're no you are small no you are small but i tell people it's like what if you had a perfectly proportioned and colored tiger not a cub, but a full-grown tiger, and it was the size of a bobcat, you'd be like, wait, you still have that, whoa, it's a tech, no, oh, it's like that, it throws you off. And what's really strange about this, there's, there's, there's tiny falcons, like falconets, all the way up to jeer falcons, of course, there's such a range of falcon sizes, but the difference is, this is a large falcon that comparatively rapidly has evolved small. A big bird turning little instead of the other way around and in a very rap in a, rapidly in a short space of comparatively short space of time you can kind of see it uh when you compare to like uh you you put a kestrel next to a tida falcon or a merlin next to a tida falcon and you can see do you still have the the proportions of a peregrine this broad shouldered broad chested powerful headed thick beaked falcon uh that's just an entry level comparison i i am going to have an in-depth video i do want to compare them directly to kestrels and directly to merlins uh in the coming months i want to do a video showing that so that'll be coming up but just uh, a a quick glance of the two you can see okay there's a huge difference and these birds are very dense it's like holding a brick you you you're like oh can I, i'm used to holding merlins or kestrels or even aplomatos and you're like oh that's a lot of density for a bird this size so their head first of all is oversized the whole bird has shrunk from whatever basal form of peregrine they diverged off of the whole bird has shrunk the head has shrunk the least uh, some of the females have about the same head size, almost hood-wise at least, as a male, a tersal, a nodum peregrine, like the peregrines we have around here. It's like, that's a, that's a big head for such a little bird. Their beak is a little unusual. The beak itself, you think, you th when you think about beaks of birds of prey, of raptors, uh, eagles and most hawks have a longer kind of a narrow beak. Falcons have a more bulbous beak and it's shorter. Tida falcons have an additionally more bulbous, more almost blunted. It's 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 almost like if they're made out of clay, if they bumped into a window and uh, their beak kind of got blunted a little bit, not excessively, but noticeably. Knowing that, uh, you gotta you gotta compare to what else has that sort of a beak. And if you look, uh, falconets, tiny falconets. Um, throughout Southeast Asia and stuff often will have a very uh, blunted, comparatively blunted beak. And most of your hobbies do. A hobby is a lineage of falcons. There are many old fal hobby species throughout the old world, even Australia, uh, very far ranging. But all of them do have a comparatively blunted, stumpy beak compared to like a standard peregrine falcon or a lanner falcon, a saker or a jeer, any of those. And that beak... Okay, that's an observation, but a person should take a look at that observation and say, well, why? Why would that be different? Especially when you look at all other peregrines. Every other subspecies of peregrine does not have that. Only the Tida. 
That's the only thing that's branched. Very, again, and again, a Tida is not classified as a subspecies of Peregrine. But again, what I talked about earlier is the case could be legitimately argued based off of the genetic divergence percentage. It could be argued. They could, it, it, they could, could be considered a subspecies of Peregrine. So why do they have that? Okay, well, keep that in mind. Hobbies and falconets also have that as well, right? But pause, they also have a reduced tomial tooth. So all falcons, all true falcons, their beak has an extra notch that's called a tomial tooth. And what that is typically used for is to snap the necks of their prey. Most falcons are billed as bird hunters. They target birds, small to large, and they knock them out of the sky when they have them on the ground. Prey is struggling, you got some bird, you know, let's say a peregrine falcon catches a duck and the duck's flailing and kicking. Most falcons have comparatively stiff, plasticky feathers that gives them a speed advantage, but also makes them somewhat brittle. So you want to dispatch your prey quickly. This is something hawks and eagles do not do, or owls, they couldn't care less. They start eating their prey alive. But most large falcons, and even smaller ones, once they have their prey on the ground, they bend down, use that tomial tooth, and they snap the neck of the bird they've just caught. Well, that tomial tooth is severely reduced on these birds, on these tida falcons. Now, in addition, the ridge line, the front, if you're looking at the beak, the front ridge line is slightly thicker leading down to the tip, to the point itself, than you would find on other falcons. So the proportions are out of whack. So reduced tomial tooth, uh, b slightly blunted beak, so it's not sticking out as far, and an increased thicker ridgeline leading to the point, the very tip of the beak. Now again, we don't see that extra thickness, but we do see those other points with hobbies and falconets, and all of those will hunt much smaller prey. If you have a duck, that's a, that's a, those are thick, well, they're not that big, I'm just, they have thick neck vertebrae. You kill a pigeon, you kill a pheasant, you kill a grouse, you kill a goose, that, you, a, a habara, a bustard. That is something that the falcons really got to get in there and, and snap. It is a bite and a snap motion. Now, if you are going after a small species of bat or a dragonfly or a grasshopper or a swift, which are all things that tied to falcons, hobbies, and falconets often hunt, there's no need to bite and twist. You want to just bite and crunch. It's gross to mention, but it might be the neck, but it might just be the head. I'm just going to take a bat and crush its head in. I'm going to take a dragonfly and crush its head in. Now, Tida falcons are not particularly insectivorous. None of the literature I could find really mentions that. So they are targeting swifts and bats, but those are still prey with very tiny necks and uh, very, uh, very thin skulls. And so having that thicker ridge line coming down the tip of the beak and, and and the blunted beak and the and again you don't use it you lose it the lesser tomial tooth just allows for using the tip instead to just crunch so a tida falcon catches a bat then it flies up with it crunch catches a swift flies up to a cliff crunch and it's one bite instead of a bite and a snap that's the purpose of it everything all the rest of the physical attributes i'm going to bring up on this species i want you to think if you were a designer, if you were an engineer, and you're like, okay, where do we cut weight? We want to cut weight where we can, but we still want a very dense, heavy bird, but we don't want weight where we don't need it. We're shrinking something down. We want it dense, but where do we reduce weight? So you don't use it, you lose it. That tomial tooth, there's no need for it. You want thickness up front, thickness up front for the type of killing they do. Now, on the back of their head, we have something that's not necessarily uh, something that they alone have. Many falcons have this, and that is eye spots. You can look them back, and there's little light patches that uh, many species, not just birds, have those. And it's a pattern that it is believed that if, if there's a potential predator targeting and thinking of making a kill, it might be like, oh, that bird is looking at me, but it's just eye patches. And then that gives enough time for the bird to turn around and notice you and get away if you do stage an attack. So that's a pretty normal thing to have, but something worth noting. The Tida Falcon's wings are undersized for their weight. You can find that everywhere. Any video about it, like, oh yeah, they, they have a very high wing loading, which means they weigh a lot, 
for the size of their wings. But what do we mean they're undersized? What do we mean they're small? One thing after working with this Falcon that I've never seen anybody write or produce a video on is certain bones are proportionately way off for a Falcon, okay? The humerus and the ulna and radius, these specific bones are proportionately smaller, particularly the humerus from what you would have. So in other words, if you just took a Peregrine Falcon on a copy machine and shrunk it down to the size of a Tida Falcon, it would have longer humerus, ulna, and radius than a Tida Falcon does. So there is a proportionate difference in addition to a size difference. I haven't seen any Falcon like that. It makes them flap and in a very unusual way. And it also leads to some other morphologies I'm gonna talk about in just a minute. These proportions, it needs to be noted, are similar to that of a Swift, like the percentage proportions, not the size. Remember, this is a bird that is hunting Swifts. And so it has over time uh, morphed into a shape that mirrors its prey. And there's gonna be other attributes as well. We're dealing with a falcon, but it's kind of like if you were saying, hey, I'm giving you a Lego set of a peregrine falcon, but I want you to take those Legos and reassemble it in a way that is more like a Swift, if, if, if that makes sense. Uh, and there's a lot of species in the world that are that way, where the size and shape of a, of a predator and prey that have co-evolved together will be similar because of similar white lifestyles. Okay, if, if this bird, if a swift has certain ways that it can move and maneuver because of the proportions of its ulna and radius and the shape of its primaries, then a predator who ends up having those same attributes is going to be able to mirror those same flight styles and have success tackling prey. Tida falcons, like all falcons, like all true falcons, do have uh, pointed wings. They do have the long, narrow pointed wings, but it's different. The wings themselves are proportionately narrower than on peregrine. So again, if you shrink a peregrine to tight a size, it would be a narrower wing shape. Now the first on the wing, the first several primaries are extremely long and even stick out even a bit more evenly than you would on a peregrine. But after that, as you move to where the primaries and the secondaries meet up, those primaries shrink way down, uh, making a much narrower wing, but more importantly, a wing with a smaller surface area. And th that means all falcons have to do a lot of flapping and very little gliding to stay afloat, to stay airborne, I guess I should say, not afloat, but to stay airborne. Tida falcons, even more so, but they have a different way of life. So this makes them as having the highest wing loading of any falcon. So there is no other falcon species that has this much weight compared to the amount of lift provided by the surface area of the wings using Bernoulli's principle of flight. But the hunting style is very different. Again, this is a roller coaster bird. All large falcons that hunt from a dive benefit from the use of, of momentum-based hunting. But this bird takes it absolutely to the extreme. It wants to be up on a cliff, and when swifts come out or bats come out, it wants to dive just using gravity, but it wants to go up and down, where most falcons in a stoop, it's just a stoop, but they wanna go up and down and just do these just by changing the shape of their wing, not by flapping or not just by an initial hit. They're okay to do this kind of a flight against swifts and then they catch their prey and they're probably going to use updrafts from the crashing waterfall to get back up to a cliff face and eat their food. When you look at a Tida falcon perching their, and their wings are up, dorsally they're held higher. So they look like they're holding them further back than you would normally have on a normal falcon. I've seen some male jeer falcons that kind of do that same thing where their, their chest is out a lot more and their wings are back. I haven't had anybody ever notice that or point that out on a Tida Falcon, but the reason they do it, it's they don't do it for a purpose. It is just a side effect of having a really short uh, humerus. You have a shorter humerus, it's gonna pull that back up. So their wings look, uh, so they look larger chested than other falcons, but their chest isn't proportionately larger. Their ulnas are just, I mean, sorry, their humeri are just shorter, which is just making their wings sit much further back when they're folded up. On their legs, the tarsi, which is the last section of bone before you see what we call their feet. I mean, 
when we're getting into vertebrates, the foot goes up further than the foot of a raptor, but the tarsi are short. That gives them a very short, stocky, stout appearance like a potato with wings and a tail. Makes them very compact looking. Uh, it's true of all falcons, but I have never worked with any falcon with tarsi this short proportionate to their body. Uh, a lot of jeer falcons have short tarsi as a heat uh, loss reduction, but this is for a very different reason and it's even comparatively shorter. Again, all of these things, the overall wing shape, the length of the tarsi, the length of the humerus, the ulna, the radius, all of these proportions very closely mimic that, uh, well, not mimic, mirror that of swifts, which is what they hunt. So again, everything you see when you're looking at this bird, it's like, let's make a peregrine falcon small and then make all these other little subtle details more swift-like, and that makes them more effective at catching swifts. Their tail is extremely short. That's something everybody always notices, but it's also wedge-shaped. Now, usually a wedge-shaped tail, if you think of the tail of a bird fanned out, the two feathers in the middle are called the deck feathers. And usually birds that evolve a wedge-shaped tail from a non-wedge-shaped basal form, it's the deck feathers that get longer and then the subsequent side tail feathers uh, kind of match up and you get a wedge this way. The Tita falcon is the exact opposite. The tail is short, but the side feathers are what are reduced. So it's a wedge going in rather than a wedge going out. And again, the purpose of this, or how this is most likely benefiting the bird, is not by the shape of it, but by the weight reduction. If it's mostly, and you look at the tails of swifts, again, you're mirroring the very short, slightly wedged in shape of a swift tail. You don't have this with any other falcon at all. Uh, and a very unusual thing. But again, you're cutting weight and you're mirroring the body shape and, 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 and feather shapes of your prey. The feather shafts themselves on the primaries, secondaries, and tail feathers of the bird are extremely narrow, way undersized. Uh, I was, I've been looking at some merlin feathers and thinking merlins are smaller by weight, by size, by everything, and yet merlins, the shaft on merlin feathers, are much thicker, much wider. Uh, and again, this is, once again, mimicking what it hunts. But you think about a Merlin, there is gonna be more uh, horizontal flapping. Merlins do more chasing, uh, where it seems tight of falcons are mostly sitting up on a cliff waiting for something to come by and then diving. They're not even having to do a whole lot. There's winds by those cliffs, there's updrafts. And so being that small, uh, you, can, you can do okay to reduce your weight load by having narrower shafts. But again, they look so delicate and breakable compared to any falcon this size. Again, uh, some I've seen kestrels with primary shafts thicker than the tips on the shafts of Tida falcons. It's really interesting. They are very much built for momentum-based flight. They're, be they're built for dives and pretty much nothing else. Because of that, if you're ever gonna fly one of these birds, to keep them in shape enough, you're not flying them from a cliff. If you're gonna have them wait on and circle up like a peregrine, it is hard. You have to keep them incredibly fit. I, I'm amazed at how, how quickly out of shape this Tita Falcon I'm working with gets and how it's crucial to have that vital muscle built up in the chest. But perhaps the thing that I've been most surprised about, not only with the Tita Falcon I'm working with, by the way, I haven't even said her name. Uh, I named her Rahara and she is, so tame, especially coming from a breeding project. She's not a young bird. And she just instantly like, hi, are we friends now? Uh, and Nathan Norris uh, and his family worked with her a bit before I got her. So that's part of it is their work and their effort. But as I've talked to other people who have flown them as well, they have noted that this species is just ridiculously tame. I can't think of any evolutionary pressure, any selective pressure in nature that would have caused that but I have never in my life, not even with the tamest kestrels, worked with a falcon that is so just eager to just hang out. I don't hood her. I drive with her just fine next to me. And like I said, her favorite place on earth is sitting on a couch right next to me. I put some newspaper down below for her to poop on and we just watch documentaries. She's just like, okay, we're just sitting here. Just gentle as can be in that way. And she has amazing grip. 
She has a lot of power and she can bite hard, but she's not prone to. She just likes to hang out. Again, that, I'm working with one bird and I've only talked to a handful of other falconers who have also worked with them, but all of them have said the same thing, this incredibly gentle disposition. Don't know why, but it's something worth noting with this species. Now, overall, this is this video is meant to be sort of a breakdown of understanding this species, especially biologically. They're uh, not very common to find in the United States in breeding programs, and working with them is is very unique, very different. I know some falconers, uh, I, think, I think Pete Jungeman uh, crossed them with barberry falcons, which also were considered a subspecies of peregrine when I was young. Barberries, and that I've heard great things about that hybrid. But one of the things this bird does not like to be on the ground or low, it, it wants to be high, very, very high. And I don't have her on a normal perch, I have her on a perch almost at ceiling level. And she's like, ah, because they're vulnerable. These birds, part of the reason why they're so rare is they have such a niche form of what they, they want to be in very specific cliffs with bats and swifts, that preferably by a waterfall. And if they range out for them from that, they're in regular peregrine country. A peregrine falcon is at best gonna outcompete them and at worst going to kill them and eat them. So they've gotta have these very niche areas. Uh, as such, they, they are very low on the totem pole. And I think genetically, they deep down know, hey, there could be a bigger falcon out there that's gonna get me. Any small bird knows that, but they, this seems to permeate their psychology. And so you have to watch a bird like this and make sure, is it uncomfortable where it's at? Is it feeling overly vulnerable? Uh, sometimes when I'd have her low, she'll just row her wings nonstop. And I know, okay, I need to put her higher because she's feeling very vulnerable in this setting. I have heard from some falconers who have flown them that that makes it very hard to get them to land on a lure. I have not had that problem yet. She loves to come to a lure and is like, okay, but I have heard that. And that's because they're used to catching prey and carrying it back up to a cliff, not just catching prey landing on the ground and eating it where they're open and exposed and vulnerable to larger raptors so there's a lot of considerations this bird is still very new to me i'm still learning her and working with her i want to give more about personality traits with flight and training but i wanted to give this first breakdown almost like an unboxing like what is a tita falcon really what 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 are they made of what's what are they built like so you can get a sense of it uh, and I want to do vi uh, future videos as well, again, comparing to kestrels, merlins, oplomatos, and other small falcons that I've flown. But I hope you enjoyed this video. I know it was a bit long-winded. Let me know any questions or comments you have down below. If you haven't already, please hit subscribe. It very much helps me keep this channel up and running. And as always, happy hawking. Mm -hmm.